The early days of powered flight were filled with exhilaration and peril. Technology advanced with astounding speed, from wooden struts and bicycle wheels to jet engines in less than half a century. Air travel brought continents together and opened a world of possibilities. The story of aviation is about the mechanics, the pilots, the inventors and the thrill seekers. It's a story of ingenuity and perseverance, of a dream that refused to die. The early years of the 20th century were a time of discovery and wonder in the world of aviation. People watched in awe as pilots entered a domain previously reserved for birds. With courage, skill and sheer bravado, pioneer aviators notched up a long line of record-breaking flights using innovative technology that still astounds today. The men and women present at the birth of aviation continue to inspire. Ignoring the naysayers, they risked their lives to bring us the magic of flight. In the early days of aviation, there was no limit to the imagination of some inventors. Not all prototypes were successful, but it was only a matter of time before mankind spread its wings and launched into the sky. A French sea captain who experimented with gliders in the mid-19th century wrote, In spite of me, it drew forward into the wind. Notwithstanding my resistance, it tended to rise. Thus I have discovered the secret of the bird, and I comprehend the whole mystery of flying. It was a mystery that obsessed ancient travellers, who dreamed of voyaging in winged contraptions. Elaborate designs document this desire, transforming man into bird with the addition of sail-like wings. Not surprisingly, the prototypes never flew, but each added to the sum of human knowledge. Artist and inventor Leonardo da Vinci was the most famous early aircraft designer. The medieval polymath drew up blueprints for many inventions in his meticulously detailed diaries, including a helicopter and a hang glider. Da Vinci was particularly fascinated with birds, producing a study in 1505 called Codex on the Flight of Birds, in which he noted that the centre of gravity in a flying bird did not coincide with its centre of pressure. The Codex also included several flying machine designs, but when the great inventor built them, they failed to launch. Da Vinci was a man far ahead of his time. His paper designs highlight his incredible scientific skills and ability to think in three dimensions. As well as flying machines, Da Vinci designed a giant parachute, foreshadowing a technology that was still 200 years away from becoming a reality. In 1783, in front of the French royal family, a balloon designed by the Montgolfier brothers made the first recorded manned flight. The English, a haughty nation, arrogate to themselves the empire of the sea. The French, a buoyant nation, make themselves masters of the air, said the future Louis XVIII. Joseph and Etienne Montgolfier were from a family of paper manufacturers. They shrewdly married solid engineering principles with beautiful design, making their balloon ascents an eye-catching experience. The Montgolfier prototype balloon was made from paper lined with alum for fireproofing and held together by 2,000 buttons. The sight of humans sailing through the air was remarkable enough to 18th century Parisians. But to add to the wonder, the Montgolfier brothers commissioned their balloon to be an artwork. The beauty of balloons drifting through the air was undeniable, but it was a dangerous pastime. In 1785, Pierre Romain and Jean-Francois de Rosier became the first people to die 
in a ballooning accident when they crashed to earth in a hydrogen fueled fire. Twelve years later, Frenchman André Jacques Garnon became the first person to make a successful parachute descent from a balloon. His canvas umbrella contraption brought him safely to earth from a height of 3,000 feet. Ballooning technology continued to improve with aeronauts turning to rubber-coated silk as the material of choice. Slung beneath the huge envelope in a wicker gondola, pilots added hydrogen to the envelope to ascend. As hydrogen is lighter than air, the gas displaced air molecules and lifted the balloon higher. To descend, the pilots simply opened valves and released hydrogen. Balloon ascents were a popular spectator sport in the 19th century, but some balloonists raised the ire of farmers whose crops were trampled by people eager to get close to a landing. In 1873, French aeronaut Jules Dufour and his wife made an unscheduled landing into stormy seas when their craft, the Neptune, was swept out over the ocean. Fortunately, fishermen rescued them. A talented scientist, Dufour invented a scheme to steer balloons using sails and drag ropes, paving the way for future experiments in controlled flight. Artists of the 19th century looked to the future and came up with their own versions of flying machines. And the military found new uses for balloons, with Thaddeus Lowe carrying out reconnaissance in a Union Army balloon during the American Civil War. One man who observed the fascinating spectacle was a visitor from Germany, Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin. Early aeronauts were at the mercy of air currents, with ascending and descending the only part of the flight they could control. After observing the first balloon ascension, American scientist and statesman Benjamin Franklin wrote to his friend Sir Joseph Banks, These machines must always be driven by the winds. Perhaps mechanic art may find easy means to give them progressive motion. By the mid-19th century, aeronautical inventors were closing in on the technology that would provide progressive motion. In 1852, Henry Gifford flew the first flight of a steerable balloon, managing 17 miles at a top speed of 5 miles an hour. However, the craft's steam-powered engine was too slow to control the vehicle. Alberto Santos Dumont demonstrated the maneuverability of airships by taking his gasoline-powered craft on a flight around the Eiffel Tower, for which he was awarded the Deutsche Prize in 1901. German Army officer Count von Zeppelin was determined to put Germany at the forefront of airship development. He used his own money to build the Luftschiff Zeppelin, or LZ-1. Powered by twin Daimler motors, it flew for 20 minutes on July 2, 1900. It was the beginning of an era of glory for German aviation. Zeppelin's inventions inspired public support, and he was able to finance future airships through donations and a lottery. But like all aviators of the era, Zeppelin struggled to keep his monster airship under control. In 1908, his Zeppelin LZ-4 was caught in a storm and crashed, injuring four people. The disaster virtually bankrupted the Count, but with public support he persevered with his airship program and went on to greater things. Lawrence Hargrave emigrated to Australia from England as a 15-year-old with his family. He worked as an engineer and an astronomical observer before inheriting his father's fortune and devoting his life to aeronautical research. On the 12th of November, 1894, at Stanwall Park Beach near Sydney, Hargrave used four box kites tied together to lift himself from the ground. He ascended 16 feet in a wind speed of 21 miles per hour. Aviators looking to improve the lift-to-drag ratio of early gliders eagerly followed Hargrave's breakthrough. 
A pioneer who used boat kites and airships in an innovative way was photographer George Lawrence. Lawrence designed his own panoramic cameras and used a string of seven kites to hoist the equipment aloft from where it took images of the earth up to 2,000 feet above the ground. Lawrence activated the camera shutters by sending an electrical current through the kite strings. When the shutter released, a small parachute fluttered down, signaling that the photo had been taken and the camera could be brought down and reloaded. But it was two brothers from Midwestern America who were to have the greatest impact on the world of aviation. Wilbur and Orville Wright grew up in Dayton, Ohio, towards the end of the 19th century. Orville was the more mechanically minded of the two, while Wilbur loved the intellectual stimulation of study. Their mother, Susan, taught Orville and Wilbur how to make their own inventions. Aged eight and 12, the boys were given a toy helicopter powered with a rubber band. The toy broke, so they built their own. There were five children in the family, but Orville and Wilbur were particularly close. Wilbur later wrote, from the time we were little children, my brother Orville and myself lived together, played together, worked together, and in fact, thought together. We usually owned all of our toys in common, talked over our thoughts and aspirations, so that nearly everything that was done in our lives has been the result of conversations, suggestions, and discussions between us. As young men, the brothers opened their own bicycle sales and repair shop. The business proved profitable. America was in the grip of a cycling craze, and the Wright brothers designed and manufactured some popular bicycles. The business provided funds for the brothers to indulge in their real passion, aviation. Their sister Catherine took over the business, so Orville and Wilbur could devote more and more time to designing flying machines. Wilbur came up with a plan to use cables to draw the struts and spars of a glider together. Unlike other aeroplane prototypes, the pilot would actually have control. The brothers' initial interest in aviation had been sparked by the achievements of inventors such as Otto Lilienthal. The German gliding enthusiast made several flights, but constantly battled with the tendency of his gliders to pitch down, a characteristic that killed him in 1896 when he fell 17 meters and broke his spine. The Wright brothers agreed with Lilienthal the gliding experience was the best way to develop flying techniques that could be used with powered flight. But the poor lift of the gliders led them to suspect that the equation being relied on by Lilienthal and others was wrong. Their own experiments confirmed this, so they built a six-foot wind tunnel to test various sized wings and balance lift against drag. In this way, they discovered that long, narrow wings provided a far better lift-to-drag ratio than the broader wings used previously. Through trial and error, Wilbur and Orville progressed from flying the glider as a kite to manned flights. The 1902 glider contained a movable rear rudder connected to the wing warping system, controlled by a hip cradle. With the problem of pilot control finally solved, the brothers were ready to add power. On the 23rd of March, 1903, they applied for a patent for their flying machine. The biggest problem was finding an engine light enough for the glider. None of the manufacturers the Wrights contacted were able to make one to their specifications. So the brothers decided to make their own. Their shop mechanic, Charlie Taylor, took just six weeks to build the lightweight aluminium design. On the 17th of December, 1903, they put their powered glider to the test. On the 17th of December, 1903, they put their powered glider to the test. The wind was gusting at 30 miles an hour and they were flying into a stiff wind. Orville took off, and in 40 feet, he was off the ground. At that same moment, John Daniels took the historic, famous photograph. 
The plane in the stiff wind proved difficult for Orville to fly, but he was determined to stay in the air as long as he could. He was in the air for eight seconds, 10 seconds, 12 seconds later, 120 feet from the starting point. Orville landed the plane at the number one stone marker. It was only 12 seconds, 120 feet, but that was the first time man was able to break those bonds with the earth with a powered flyer. Orville and Wilbur later wrote, we realized the difficulties of flying in so high a wind, but estimated that the added dangers in flight would be partly compensated for by the slower speed in landing. The brothers made three more flights with Wilbur piloting the flyer more than 800 feet. Unfortunately, when they put the machine down to take a rest, a gust of wind blew it over and smashed it beyond repair. It never flew again. But Orville and Wilbur had already flown into the history books. For the next two years, they refined their designs and to developing the Flyer 5, the first aircraft able to take off and land under pilot control. The patent the brothers took out in 1906 covered the method of varying wing angle to control an aircraft, and they fought several court battles against other aviators who incorporated this into their aircraft design without paying royalties. The brothers negotiated successful contracts with the French syndicate and the American army and gave public flights around the world to publicize their aircraft. Other aviators, including Louis Blairot, were awestruck by the Wright brothers' ability to control the aeroplanes. But although Orville and Wilbur had made great progress in aeronautical design, flying was still a perilous business. On the 17th of September, 1908, Orville took Army Lieutenant Thomas Selfridge as his passenger on a flight at a United States Army base at Fort Myer, Virginia. The propeller split in mid-flight and the right flyer plummeted to the ground, killing Selfridge and badly injuring Orville. Typically, Orville's main concern was not of going back into the air, but whether he would recover in time to complete the Army test flights. Sadly, the Wright brothers' collaboration came to an end in 1912, when Wilbur died of typhoid, aged just 45. At the Smithsonian Institution, an inscription says of the pair, by original scientific research, the Wright brothers discovered the principles of human flight. As inventors, builders and flyers, they further developed the aeroplane, taught man to fly, and opened the era of aviation. Well north of Kill Devil Hill, on the remote banks of the Lake of Gold in Nova Scotia, Scottish-born inventor Alexander Bell was carrying out his own aeronautical experiments at his Canadian estate. The inventor of the telephone, Dr. Bell, was fascinated by aviation and became a founding member of the Aerial Experiment Association in 1907, together with Glenn Curtis, Casey Baldwin, J.A.D. McCurdy and Thomas Selfridge. In 1908, the association launched Red Wing, its first heavier-than-air machine, with Casey Baldwin at the controls. It crashed on the first flight and they moved on to White Wing and then Junebug, which Curtis successfully flew a distance of 5,090 feet. On the 23rd of February 1909, McCurdy took off from the frozen lake to pilot the association's most ambitious craft, Silver Dart, on the first powered aircraft flight in Canadian history. Like the June Bug, the Silver Dart's V8 engine was designed by Curtis, but the lightweight design attracted the ire of the Wright brothers who sued him for infringing their patent. After several appeals, the Wrights finally won their case in 1913. A motorcycle manufacturer, Glenn Curtis, was one of America's most important aeronautical designers and pilots. The winner of many air races, Curtis became closely involved in designing aircraft for the American military, and he was a pioneer in the design and manufacture of seaplanes and flying boats. He also developed the first aircraft to take off from a ship. A pilot of considerable skill, Curtis had the honor of becoming the first person to receive a pilot's license from the Aero Club of America in 1911.
When the world went to war in 1914, few traditional military men saw the potential of flying machines. But one who did was Italian officer Giulio Due. A new weapon has come forth, he said. The sky has become the new battlefield. It wasn't long before rapid strides in aviation technology were proving him right. The previous century, Thaddeus Lowe's balloon had provided reconnaissance information for the Union forces during the Civil War. Now, a new breed of aircraft was taking to the skies, loaded with deadly weapons. Still just flimsy scraps of wood and fabric, the first generation of fighter aeroplanes were nevertheless fast and manoeuvrable. But their effectiveness depended on a new breed, the fighter pilot. Keen eyesight, stamina and fast reflexes were essential. And even those traits would not necessarily be enough to save the pilot from a fiery death. The end of the war saw a huge drop in aircraft production in the United States, with the annual figure dropping from 14,000 in 1918 to 263 in 1922. The French government continued to commission aircraft and used the surplus to subsidize a new field of commercial aviation. Civil flying resumed in 1919, and passenger services were established for short routes within Europe and America, usually made up of ex-military aeroplanes flown by ex-military pilots. Conditions were far from luxurious, and one carrier, Aircraft Transport and Travel, issued passengers with thick coats, helmets, goggles and gloves, and sometimes hot water bottles. Over the past century, the airline industry has grown from an experimental mode of transportation to a major part of the world's transportation system. Modern air transport has certainly come a long way from its humble beginnings. Passengers travel today in air-conditioned comfort in spacious cabins where they can rest and relax and arrive refreshed at their destination. The experience today can be further enhanced by the next generation HD in-flight entertainment, wireless internet and smartphone connectivity. Emerging technologies are ushering in more fuel-efficient, comfortable and exotic aircraft. Get ready for the future of flight. Man is a fortunate species. Over thousands of years, our intelligence has given us tools and technology, art and science, society and civilization. We now possess a treasure house of man's great achievements. <laughs>